Asian patrons of the Arts of the Vatican Museums. I'm Thomas Williams. And I'm Liz Lev. And we're here to talk to you today in this fourth session of our wonderful course on wine, art, and faith. We're going to talk about the surprising rise of American wines. Now, there's wine made in all 50 states of, of the United States of America, but tonight we're going to be talking about California wine because, of course, that is the area of the United States that has really been the most famous and most successful in the wine industry. Also the one that is the most closely tied with our Catholic faith, going back as it does to the Franciscans and especially Fray Junipero Serra, the father of California wine, who we'll have, we will have occasion to speak of in greater depth in today's lecture. Um, for our wines, as usual, we've decided to do one red and one white, and uh, we've selected them really in terms of some, just our favorites from the area. We chose a, Char a Chardonnay and a Cabernet Sauvignon because they are quintessentially Californian and because when American wines really hit their apex, when they were launched onto the international scene in 1976, those were the two wines that were award-winning. It was a Cabernet Sauvignon and a Chardonnay. So in honor of that historic moment, that's what we're going to drink with you today. And you'll be hearing about that exciting story during your upcoming lecture by Dr. Williams. It's a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun today, but let's get right to our wines. Excellent. So I will be tasting the Farniente Chardonnay. This is a wine, uh, um, a vineyard that came into being in 1979. It was actually already a very old vineyard that had been planted in 1885, but um, it had gone out of business. It had been brought over by an Italian immigrant who called it Farniente in the sense of the, the, the sweet doing nothing. And I guess he really did do nothing because the vineyard went out of business. But then, in 1979, it was picked up by another family and it became incredibly successful and is one of the most iconic Chardonnays in California. For my part, I'm going to pre present to you this beautiful 2016 award-winning Groth Cabernet Sauvignon. It's their reserve from their Oakville estate and it's a splendid wine. It took 96 points with Robert Parker. That doesn't mean necessarily that we're always going to agree with those, those kind of numbers, but it does tell you something. So let's start with our first enjoying the beautiful colors of these wines. Again, this much more golden and uh, very sort of limpid and, and, and shining wine. I love these, these very bright, uh, shimmering um, uh, white Chardonnays. I, on the other hand, have a very deep garnet cover. These are very powerful wines. California wine in general is very fruit forward and really hits you. There's a, there's a lot on the nose and a lot that we have to look at. So this deep colored garnet, which already starts to show some age, it's not an old wine, it's 2016, and these uh, California cabs will last a good 15, 20 years in the cellar. Uh, so this is relatively young, but it's still already taken on a beautiful color. It's lost a little bit of its original plum color and moved on toward a garnet. One of the lovely things about these Chardonnays, these California Chardonnays, is that they can indeed also age for quite some time. So the, um, the alcohol content, even in the white wine, is fairly high. It's 14.3% because, again, these, these very um, uh, sugar-dense grapes that are vinified. So what we're going to do, as we've done other times, we're going to go through the five S's with you. And I think you already remember what they are. They are C, swirl, then it's going to be sniff, sip, and savor. And let's start with the Chardonnay. Now, the joy of the Farniente Chardonnay is its bouquet. It has a wonderful uh, stone fruit, with peaches and apples, but also a really bright citrus, um, uh, a sense of um, a lime zest and lemon zest and orange, and even, even a little nuttiness to it. When I sniff mine. As I said, these are very fruit forward wines and you get immediately plum, a little bit of red currant, some dark blackberry, there's a little bit of cassis and some of these other um, berry notes that you get. There's also a little hint of baking spice. Uh, this spends a year in new French oak and that also conveys some of what they call the tertiary notes that it, it obtains from the wood, which makes it very rich and round. Shall we taste? Yes. One of the signature elements of California Chardonnay, at least these very famous, is the time spent in oak. 
And this, by many people, and when it's overdone, results in this oaky Chardonnay that people complain about. But actually, when it's done in just the right way, as in the case of Farniente, where it just has this light, light, light encounter with this beautiful oak, it gets just a little bit of a toasted, a, 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 a tertiary flavor or a tertiary scent of this, of this toastedness to it. It's a very round wine. It has this great sort of um, coating of the inside of your mouth. You feel like you're drinking something substantial, although it has these lovely, bright, tangy, acidic notes that come as part of its sort of mm, mm, uh, citrus, uh, citrusy notes. Mine is, is almost 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, just so you know. It has a little bit of Petit Verdot and a little bit of Merlot, but it's primarily Cabernet Sauvignon. And it's a very, very powerful, I can still taste it, even though we sipped it a good minute ago, I can still taste it very vividly in my mouth. And it's calling out for a nice big ribeye steak with some chard. It's got the beautiful tannin feel. Um, I don't know if you've realized how to detect tannins in red wines. Uh, they, they'll never be in white wines, but in red wines, if you run a little bit of the wine over your gums, you actually feel it. You can't really taste tannins, but you feel them. They have an astringent quality. They dry. They get a little raspy in your, in your mouth, and that's what makes you want to eat some food with this wine. The Chardonnay goes very, very well with pasta, with fish. It has a um, it has a wonderful buttery flavor, and that comes from the malolactic fermentation, in which the malic acid, the acid that is much more uh, tart, it comes from the word apple. It gives a sort of a scent of apple to uh, to the to the wine. It, that acid is then changed into lactic acid, which is an acid that will give a flavor more like butter or milk. And so this that's one of the secrets of this buttery, rich rind flavor that goes with so many different foods. Well, I hope that you've been able to drink these wines with us. Hope you were able to find something similar. If not, look for them. They're, they're beautiful. These are two absolutely fine vineyards. But in general, look for these notes that we've been talking about in California cabs and in California Chardonnays with some variation. And now we're going to go on to a presentation yes. about the history. No more wine for you. You have to work. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Yet another wonderful snippet of entertainment and learning from Liz Leff and Thomas Williams. They have now taken us from the old world in the first few lectures to the new world of wines. I have personally enjoyed the Far Niente Cabernet Sauvignon before, but I did try to get my hands on the Chardonnay these past few weeks, but I could not find any here in, uh, in Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. Hello everyone, I'm Thomas Ng and I'm very pleased and very privileged to, your, to be a moderator today. Welcome, welcome to lecture four of the APAVM's Faith, Art and Wine series. As mentioned earlier, we are taking this subject to the new world today. We will learn about all the twists, turns and intrigue of how wine, art and architecture of our faith found their way to California and how America flourished to become one of the world's leading wine producers. And we really could not have found a better speaker for today than Dr. Thomas Williams. To avoid confusion, because I'm Thomas too, I'm going to refer to him as Dr. Williams, just for today. As an accomplished theologian, he not only has taught and published extensively, he is also a TV celebrity as a Vatican analyst on NBC, CBS, and Sky News. But just as important for us today, Dr. Williams also happens to be a certified wine sommelier with the Italian Wine Association. I could really say so much more about him, but in the interest of allowing maximum time for you to enjoy his sharing, I'm going to stop here. But before I hand over the mic to Dr. Williams, I would like to encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A box as and when you think of them. We will make sure all your questions will be addressed. Over to you, Dr. Williams. Hello, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you some more to be able to, to talk about this fascinating uh, topic that we've got today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed as much as I do. Uh, it's so exciting to see how American wine started at literally nothing uh, a little over a couple hundred years ago and became what it is today, a booming business, an international iconic business, uh, especially coming out of California and the West Coast, but now, you know, as Liz was saying in our presentation earlier, wine is made in all 50 states of the U.S. and, and sold. So how did we get there? That's what we're going to look at today. 
Um, as usual, I'm gonna share my screen with you so that you can follow along in my PowerPoint uh, presentation. I will do this right now. Um, and we're gonna start as is logical at, at the beginning. Uh, we're gonna start at how things were, uh, all came to, to, uh, to uh, an outpouring of desires. Uh, I've broken this talk into six acts. And the first act is titled Great Expectations. It's a famous Dickens title of one of his novels, but it really was born of great expectations. The original American colonists on the East Coast, uh, from a lot of them is settling in Virginia, but others in Massachusetts and of those 13 colonies, there was a great desire among them uh, to be wine producers. In fact, the oldest act, this is uh, original legislation from the Virginia colony uh, called Act 12, which stipulated that every colonist had to uh, plant at least 10 vines of vitis vinifera, which is the European uh, grape stock, and make wine out of them. They were required, every single colonist was required to make wine. Um, it didn't always go very well. So this is in 1619 already. This is long before uh, the Declaration of Independence in, in 1776. This is just with the original colonies. This was legislation in, in Virginia. Um, but we can see that already from the very beginning, there was great interest in having America be a wine producing land. Um, the founding fathers themselves, the ones you see here are on the left is George Washington, above is Thomas Jefferson, down below Ben Franklin, and on the right is Thomas Paine. There was immense interest, especially uh, by the one you see above there, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who had he, he first of all was the cellar master for George Washington, the first president. He was the cellar master for James Madison and James Monroe, two other presidents. And of course he had his own collection. He was the third president of the United States. Uh, he traveled extensively in Europe, especially in France. He took copious notes of all the places he visited. He had immense interest. And he also saw wine growing for America as a cure for a problem that was growing the colonies, which was alcoholism through what he called ardent spirits. Uh, there was whiskey made natively from corn. There was a lot of rum being uh, imported at that time. And Jefferson had the idea that if Americans could start making and drinking wine, it would be a much more civilized country. So he has this very uh, interesting line he said, we could in the United States make as great a variety of wines as are made in Europe. Not exactly of the same kinds, but doubtless as good. These are these great expectations I was talking about. This desire for the United States, the nascent country of the United States to become a great uh, producer of wines. This is something that, that Jefferson wrote in 1803. Um, another thing that he wrote on wines uh, where he calls himself a moralist, he says, I rejoice as a moralist at the prospect of a reduction of the duties on wine, the taxes, by our national legislature. It's an error to view a tax on that liquor as merely a tax on the rich. It is a prohibition of its use to the middling class of our citizens and a condemnation of them to the poison of whiskey, which is desolating their houses. And this very famous line of Jefferson's follows, no nation is drunken where wine is cheap and none is sober, where the dearness of wine substitutes ardent spirits as the common beverage. Mm -hmm. It is in truth, the only antidote to the bane of whiskey. So interestingly, Jefferson made this very strong distinction between uh, these hard spirits, hard liquor and wine. And he considered wine to be a civilizing force. Um, Jefferson had many journeys. You know that he had been uh, a diplomat working in Paris representing the United States. And while he was there, this is a trip he made in 1787. But look at this. It was a 1,200 mile trip. Uh, he left Paris, which you can see at the top of your screen. And he went down all the way down to uh, the Provençal region in the south of France. He went over to Italy and visited the north of Italy, the Piedmont region. Uh, trying out what are, you know, nowadays Barolo and Barbaresco come from that area. He came back and then went down 
all along the south of France to the southwest, came up into Bordeaux. Uh, we still have his notes that he took visiting Chateau d'Iquem, visiting Chateau Margaux, some of the great names that are still very famous today. Then he went up to the northwest and then came back eventually going through the Loire Valley, where, as you know, some great Sauvignon, uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc is produced today and then wound up back in Paris. So a fascinating time. He was a great wine importer. Um, in fact, during his administration, it is said that he spent $10,000 on imported wine, which was an absolute fortune at the time. Um, so this is something that, that he, this great desire that he had, that not only would we be importing wines, but the United States would be actually producing great wines. Now, an interesting fact is this, there are many types of grape vines. Uh, there are different species, but there's only one grape species. It's called Vitis vinifera. You see it on the center of your screen. Vitis vinifera literally means a wine-making grape. And all the varietals, all these breeds, if you will, of wine that you can see on your screen and many, many more, all the wine that we drink today is made from Vitis vinifera grapes. So these are not different species, Merlot and Semillon and Nebbiolo. These are different wine, wine varietals, but they're not different species. They all come from one species, which is Vitis vinifera. And this is what Jefferson first tried to do. He planted Vitis vinifera at his home in Monticello. He planted it um, in, in all through Virginia. A bunch of the colonists tried planting this and it kept dying. It kept getting killed. There were, and they couldn't understand why it was that they couldn't successfully uh, produce vitis vinifera in the United States. It was a very, very frustrating thing for Jefferson and for others as well. The U.S. does have a number of native grapes, and the colonists tried making wine from these as well, vitis labrusca, vitis riparia, vitis estivalis, and there are, there are several others. But the wine came out tasting musky. In fact, the colonists, the word that they used for it was foxy because it's, it tasted like a fox smells. So it was very, very unpleasant. So the colonists found themselves in the very tough situation of not being able to successfully grow vitis vinifera to make all the beautiful wines that they were importing from Europe. And at the same time, they couldn't make a tasty wine using the native grapes, which did not produce good wine at all. So this was the, the frustration that we have experiencing in the, in the young United States. Um, the problem with the Vitis vinifera was that there were local vine diseases and pests that didn't exist in Europe that would attack the vines and the grapes. You had black rot, something called downy mildew and powdery mildew. Plus there were parasites like the Phylloxera root louse that would attack the roots of these grapevines and they would die and they just could not make them. They would plant over and over again and they'd always end up dying. In fact, in 1773, Jefferson gave 2,000 acres of land, uh, which was next to his home in Monticello, to an Italian winemaker, a viticulturist named Filippo Mazze, and he worked with him planting Vitis vinifera all over these 2,000 acres. And again, the, the vines just kept dying. This was his home, his iconic home, which is preserved today in Monticello. And it was right next door where he had this experiment, which kept failing. Although nice news is that today, wine is actually grown on that very same land. Uh, a lot of the wine that uh, Jefferson purchased has been, the, the bottles that are kept have been resold at auction. This is just an example of the Chateau de Chem that he apparently uh, brought back with him in 1787 from that journey, which sold at auction for $56,588. So at least he made some good investments. Our second act is going to be the first small success story of American wine. We've seen the frustration, these great expectations in the colonies and how they were frustrated. But there was some success along the way, even before more modern times. And we're going to talk right now about a fellow named Nicholas Longworth. He had the first successful, commercially successful venture in winemaking. And of all places, it was in Cincinnati, Ohio. Not exactly a place that we associate with wine. It's not something we think of right away, but it was 
the, the, the heart of winemaking in the early 1800s. It was in the 1830s that, that Longworth made the first commercially successful wine. And it was a sparkling wine, interestingly enough, made from a Native American grape called the Catawba grape. And Catawba was a, 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 a strain of that Vitis Labrusca that we saw before, a Native American grape. And by making this sparkling wine, the vinification, he was able to make a very, very tasty wine, it became popular not only in the United States, but actually became exported uh, to Europe. It was the first wine that was exported from the US into Europe. And uh, this was going on from the 1830s up to the, to the 1850s. This is um, from the Sunbury Gazette. This is in 1851, and I'll just read it to you. You can see it on your screen. In the vicinity of St. Louis, native wine is made in considerable quantities and of qualities highly commended. But Cincinnati continues to take the lead in this branch of domestic produce. A recent letter from that place says, I've just returned from a visit to one of Nicholas Longworth's wine cellars where I saw 75,000 bottles of sparkling Catawba and about 40,000 gallons of wine in casks varying from 50 to 50, 40 to 50 gallons in each. And he goes on to describe uh, the, the cellars. And at the end, he says, the Catawba grape is, I believe, much preferred to any other variety for wine and invariably ripens better than the Isabella, another Native American grape in this climate. So this was something that, that Americans were really getting excited about in the mid 19th century. This is um, from Harper's Weekly, as you can see, a journal of civilization. And the pictures below, you can see on the left, Longworth's Vineyard near Cincinnati. These are drawings, obviously. These are, these are, um, these are uh, draft copies. And then on the right, Longworth's Wine Cellars and his Wine Press, which you can see they're being operated by these two fellows that are turning it to press the wine. So that was uh, Nicholas Longworth, unfortunately, in the end, suffered the same uh, thing that a lot of American wines did, especially on the East Coast and into the Midwest where Cincinnati was, they eventually all died. Uh, the weather was very intemperate and they ended up freezing to death. Uh, his entire crop was eventually destroyed. But that was at least a momentary success story. We're going to now turn to something that interests us for two key reasons. One, because of our, its overlap with our Catholic faith, and secondly, because it was the birth of the most exciting and successful wine venture in American history, which is California wine. And we're talking, of course, about the Franciscans who settled those mission properties up and down the California coast. And we're talking now in, um, uh, in the, the uh, 1700s and the 1600s as well. So I'm just going to advance the screen. And we have kind of the star of the show, someone who's now considered the father of California wine, Father Junipero Serra, who was a Franciscan missionary. He was the superior of the community. And as you can see on the right, the list of the missions, it, it, you probably already know this, but so many of the, the major cities in California bear the names of saints. And the reason is because those cities grew up around mission territory. They grew up on the, around the missions that went from south to north, starting in San Diego, the Alcala, the first mission, and going all the way up to San Francisco, the name obviously of St. Francis, named after the founder of these Franciscan monks. And Franciscan missionaries planted California's first Vitis vinifera, and you'll recall that that's the European wine bearing grape that, that makes all the great wines in the world. They, they planted a version of Vitis vinifera at Mission San Diego de Alcala way back in seven, 1769. It says 1779 here. There was actually some dispute about that, but I, I have it from another source that 1769 is the more uh, believable of when that first uh, grape was planted. It's come down to us known as the Mission Grape, and the Mission Grape dominated California wine for decades uh, until we brought in some of the newer varietals that we are very familiar with today. The Mission Grape was Vitis vinifera. It had been uh, brought in first to Mexico in the 16th, uh, 16th century, 
And then eventually it was transported up. Cuttings of that grape were brought up by Fry Junipero and his monks up to Southern California and then eventually made their way up to the rest of the California um, missions. The second uh, place where he brought this grape was Mission San Gabriel Arcangel, and that's just north of the uh, San Diego region, and then eventually up to Los Angeles, and then Santa Barbara, and then all these cities that we know so well that still produce wine today. Um, so this is very interesting. We were looking at the wine production going on on the East Coast before with these English colonists, the, the, the founding fathers, if you will, of the United States. Meanwhile, all this other activity was going on at virtually the same time. Look at the date here. We're talking about 1771 and Mission San Gabriel Arcangel. So this was happening independently. And the reason was that California at the time was not a part of the United States. California was actually at this time a colony of Spain. And it wasn't until 1821 when uh, Mexico broke off from Spain declaring its independence that California became uh, a colony of Mexico. So California during these times was under first under Spanish rule, and then eventually after 1821 under uh, Mexican rule. And California did not become a state of the, of the Union of the United States until 1850, uh, considerably later. So that's why we have these kind of two separate histories. We've got this very Catholic uh, missionaries from Spain, and then eventually also from Mexico that are founding all these mission territories in California, while we have the Protestants on the East Coast uh, frustratingly trying to, to make wine work for them and they're not successful. So actually, um, you know, a big part of that was that California's climate was much, much more friendly. It's much more similar to European climate, uh, both the soil and the temperatures and the dryness of it uh, made the production of these wines much better. They didn't have the problems with the mildew that we were having on the East Coast. It didn't have the problems with these parasites and, and this root louse that were attacking the roots in the, on the East Coast. And so it just was much more friendly uh, to the growth of the Vitis vinifera wine. And then you can see going up all these different, um, you can learn your ge geography of California just by looking at the different missions that were founded by Fray Junipero and the different uh, Franciscan monks there. So this is a, a, a magnificent story and it kind of underscores something we've talked about earlier in this course of how central the Catholic church was to the development and the evolution of wine and also spreading wine throughout the world. Uh, wine exists in the new world because missionaries were taking it. Um, and in large part because they needed the wine to be able to um, say mass, to be able to uh, have that important substance necessary uh, for the Eucharist. It was after the California gold rush, the gold rush took place from 1848 to 1855, that vines were eventually planted in Northern California. So we're talking now north of San Francisco, north of these mission territories into the Napa Valley and the Sonoma Valley, which are so very famous today. Moving on to our fourth act, something that you may or may not be familiar with, an interesting little um, moment in the history of wine worldwide. And we've titled this, How America Saved French Wine. And perhaps we should actually title this act, How America Destroyed and Then Saved French Wine. And I'll explain exactly what that means. Um, there was something that uh, began happening in the 1870s in Europe. And it started in France and then it just spread to Spain and Germany and other places. It was the death of vines and it was inexplicable. Uh, these wine producers and these, these uh, grape growers were finding that vine after vine was dying. They, the leaves would fall off, they would turn brown and then they would simply die and they did not know why. So this happened over 40 years and the wine industry in Europe was decimated. And the reason, which was only discovered a little bit later, uh, this was by 1880, it was discovered that this was the phylloxera louse that was attacking the roots of the Vitis vinifera the same way it had on the East Coast in the United States. 
And the phylloxera louse was not native to Europe. It had been, nobody knows how, whether it was on somebody's boots or, or, or how it was that it got to France, but it did. Um, and it attacked and then it spread like wildfire and was just destroying again, vine after vine after vine. So what happened? How were, uh, how was French wine saved? You can see this drawing here. It's just, you can see the little uh, stages of these larvae of the, the phylloxera on the right in yellow. Um, and then a little of the history here. This is um, this particularly, this, this beginning of this from 1858 to 1868 was phylloxera first discovered in the province of Languedoc in the south of France in 1863. And look at this, 40% of French vineyards destroyed, 50% uh, wage decrease during this period. Um, and then it spread throughout Europe. What was the salvation? The salvation was grafting Vitis vinifera, all these different beautiful French uh, grapevines onto American rootstock. And the reason for that was the American rootstock had developed an immunity in some of these native grapes like the Labrusca, like the Vitis riparia, um, that were used then as roots in Europe. So the United States began exporting huge numbers of vines to Europe that were planted and then grafted onto those were the grapes, the, the familiar grapes um, from the Vitis vinifera that were growing there. Um, a lot of these came out of Missouri um, and they, were, they, they ex exported tens of thousands of grapevines into France and into Italy and, and Spain. So this was in the end, the salvation of, of, of from a louse that had been exported from the United States, it was exporting these, these rootstocks that actually were able to save these wines. I'm titling this fifth act, the Dark Ages. And the Dark Ages really were dark for the history of American wine. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm in the, in the late 1800s, especially with wines being produced on the West Coast and, and some fairly decent wines. But there was, because of the alcohol problem and the alcoholism problem in the United States, there was born a very strong temperance movement. It was a movement against the production and against the sale of alcohol. Um, and it was growing stronger and stronger and stronger in the late uh, 1800s and then in the earlier part of the 20, 20th century, um, the 1900s. And this was, it, it gained more and more momentum. Uh, a lot of women were involved in it uh, because they obviously were concerned about their alcoholic husbands and the problems that they were seeing in family life and work life. Um, and it, it grew out of New York and Massachusetts. Churches became very influential in this, in this temperance movement. And they began founding in all different states. Um, there was something called the Anti-Saloon League which began lobbying heavily for prohibition in the United States. And as you know, that eventually happened uh, with the Volstead Act, which took place uh, in 1917. It was passed by Congre uh, Congress and then eventually ratified in, in 1919 and then finally repealed 12 years later, 13 years later in 1933 by the 21st Amendment. This was a very dark time and it was dark for the future of American wines because of this association of wine with liquor. These distinctions that people like Jefferson had made that wine is a civilizing spirit, that it, he, he made this bright distinction between what he considered these ardent spirits and the more gentrified alcoholic beverage, which was wine, which was drunk with meals, drunk with other people, and it was not considered an intoxicating liquor. They were aware, obviously it could be, but it wasn't, it didn't lead to this alcoholism that was experienced in the colonies because of hard liquors. So this prohibition, as you, you can read on your screen, after one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors and the exportation from the United States in all territories subject to the jurisdiction was prohibited. 
So this was a very dark time indeed. This is the, uh, as you know from watching American movies, this was the era of the gangsters. This was the era of bootleg liquor. They would be importing it, bringing it over the border from Canada, trying to bring it in through the South, a lot of the rum, trying to bring it in from the Caribbean islands. Um, and this kind of war that was going on between the FBI and these gangsters that were trying to illegally import this liquor. Um, but because of this, obviously, the, the wine industry in California and elsewhere was decimated. Uh, wines or vines were, were just left to pasture. They would, they would plow them under and start planting other things because they didn't know if they were ever going to be able to make wine again. So it really destroyed what had been a very promising beginning of real um, wine, good wine production in California and elsewhere. This was, as you can see, these are just from these days. This is from 1919. U.S. is voted dry with the 36th state that ratified the dry amendment. Um, this was first accepted with great enthusiasm, but then eventually led to a lot of, uh, a lot of rebellion um, on the part of the Americans that just did not like being told that they could not produce or drink any alcoholic beverages at all. But even more drastic because of its long lasting effects were, was this association of wine with just booze, uh, with intoxicating liquor. And we had the growth in these years following prohibition of a very unique form of alcoholism in the United States, the birth of what are called the winos. Winos were these kind of drunks that would be drinking wine. And, and the wine that was beginning to be made in this period of the 18, uh, 1930s, 1940s, and all the way up to the 1960s was a very low quality wine. There was a lot of fortified wine that would have some other spirits added to it to make it a little bit stronger. And it was just this association of wine with getting drunk, wine with booze, exactly what Jefferson had sought to, um, sought to overcome. So it was a very, very, very tough time. And I remember even when I was growing up, this is a, these are some of the, the very, very cheap wines from the 1970s, the, early, the late 60s and early 70s, um, that are now kind of iconic because they were so bad. People talk about Boone's Farm or Night Train or Thunderbird now as a joke uh, of how bad American wines were in that period. They were very cheap, they were mass produced, and they just were not good wines. So there was, even as recently as the 1960s, there was just no understanding of America being a producer of decent wines at all. The wines that were produced were jug wines, they were very cheap, very inexpensive, and again, just considered another form of alcohol. So this was the very, very sad state of affairs in American wine leading up to this great period, and this is gonna be our final uh, act in this, in this show today, American wine's coming of age. And there is a particular date that is associated with American wine's coming of age. And that date, that year, is, believe it or not, the bicentennial year, in other words, the 200th anniversary of the founding of the country in 1976. This bicentennial year when America was celebrating its 200th, birth, 200th birthday was the year that Thomas Jefferson's dream came true. It was, if you will, a birthday gift to America for its 200th anniversary, the real coming of age of American wine. And you may or may not be familiar with this story. Perhaps you've seen the 2008 movie called Bottle Shock that kind of recounts how America leapt onto the scene of, of making great wines. For some years, there were a number of producers in California that had decided to move out of the mass production of wine and really wanted to make good, prestigious, beautiful wines. And they had been diligently worked, but this was something that was going on really behind the scenes that the world was not aware of. These weren't even exported in the United States. They were not even exported to New York and to Massachusetts, to the East Coast. It was a very local thing that was going on in California itself. So what changed everything? It was 
the work of a man, this is the actor, of course, Alan Rickman, but he's playing a real life character, a British man named Stephen Spurrier, who lived in Paris, and he had a small wine shop, which he called L'Académie du Vin, the Academy of Wine, where he would give classes, where he uh, would deal with American diplomats and British diplomats and English speakers. He, would, he spoke obviously both French and English, but he catered to uh, um, a lot of English speakers that were living or traveling into Paris at this time. And he dealt with a lot of winemakers, dealt with obviously in the first place, a lot of French winemakers, but he also dealt with some American winemakers and on their travels, some people that became his friends would bring him wines that were being produced in California. And he was very impressed with the quality of the wines. So what did he do? In 1976, he organized a, a blind wine tasting. And the purpose of this in his own words were simply to allow the French to realize that good wines were actually coming out of America. What he did not expect was the actual outcome of this. So he called in a panel of nine judges. And these were judges from the the very finest uh, restaurants. There were sommeliers from the finest restaurants in Paris. They were also uh, people who sat on the board of, of wine certification in France. So these were wine experts. And what he did was he pitted two different grapes, uh, Bordeaux Cabernet Sauvignon against California Cabernet Sauvignon and Burgundy Chardonnays against California uh, Chardonnays. And since it was a blind test, these judges did not know what it was that they were tasting. Um, and at this time, there were, there were 12 different wines brought in from the United States. And there were eight very, very good wines of, that were first growths from Bordeaux. There were Premier and Grand Cru Chardonnays from Burgundy. And I think you can guess what happened. This was this movie that kind of recounts this very exciting story. If you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend it because the story is just is brilliant. Um, but what happened was the winners, uh, both in the Chardonnay category and in the Cabernet Sauvignon category, were both California wines to the great dismay of Paris and France generally, and to the great rejoicing of the United States. So Chateau Montalena had a Chardonnay, which ended up winning uh, over the, the, the Burgundies, the, the white Burgundies from that area. And then it was a stag's leap Cabernet Sauvignon from 1973 that ended up beating out the Bordeaux. So this was an amazing moment um, that has gone down in kind of, kind of in history as the apex, the, the watershed moment in American winemaking that kind of put the US on the map. And it happened not only again for Europeans, not only for the French, but Americans themselves woke up to the fact that there were some good wines being made on the West Coast of the United States. So this launched California wines. They started uh, being exported to the East Coast of the US and then they started to be exported also to Europe and abroad. This is an actual photograph of that panel. Uh, it was at the Intercontinental Hotel out on their, their terrace where this wine tasting took place with these, this blind tasting um, that, that California ended up winning. As uh, I'm gonna quote here, what Stephen Spurrier said after this, he said, we would have been happy with a third and a fifth place and never expected it to turn out the way it did. As a result, it was shown that California wines could stand alongside the French benchmarks. On May 16th, 2016, so this was um, the 40th anniversary of that momentous occasion, the National Museum of American History commemorated this anniversary uh, of the, the Judgment of Paris with a History After Hours program. And Stephen Spurrier himself went there and the winning winemakers were present and discussed 
how their lives changed after that event and the overall impact that the judgment of Paris had had on American wine making. This I think you will find uh, fascinating. I certainly do. This is, I'm just, I need to get a better view of my own screen here. Look at this per capita US wine consumption. Wine was not drunk in the US. So I start this with the year I was born, which is 1962. In 1962, the per capita wine consumption of Americans was less than a gallon. By the time 1976 came along, that had doubled to 1.73 gallons. This is the time of the judgment of Paris. And if we look now at current state, it doubled again nowadays to per capita, meaning for each person, wine consumption in the US is over three gallons. So more than three times what it was the year I was born. Wine has become, as you see, it's just grown and grown and grown. Although I'd like to talk with you for just a moment about that interesting dip that you see. You see that night after 1986, wine consumption starts going down, 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 and hits a nadir, hits its, its bottom point in 1993 before taking off again for its current wave of success. What happened? What happened to American wines that made them dip so low in that six year period? And it really was that US wines again were the victim of their own success. In the 1980s, what happened was California wine was selling so well that they started again mass producing. They allowed the quality to slip. Um, and there was a time in particular when Chardonnay became very, very oaky, very, very buttery, and people started really rejecting it. It became too sweet. And a whole movement was begun became, called the ABC movement. And there are still members of this club today ABC standing for anything but Chardonnay. This real rebellion against California Chardonnay as being something that was kind of cloying, that was overly oaky, that was just trying way too hard. And so this rejection of this led to people actually stopping buying these wines for a period. And again, happily, California came to its senses. And nowadays, as you know, if we talked about with today's presentation, the, the Farniente, there are many, many others, Rumbauer, Flowers, uh, Cake Bread, um, just so many lovely, lovely Chardonnays that have not, that have overcome the problems that they were suffering in this period. This anything but Chardonnay time. So I'd like to close with this final slide. I think we're, we're just within our time limit here. Um, Look at the 2019 wine consumption. This is now total wine consumption in absolute terms, not per capita. The US was the largest consumer of, of wines in the world with 872 million gallons of wine drunk in the United States in 2019, which is the most recent year for which we have, we have these figures. So it now has really become a wine nation. Um, and that's also, I think, thanks in part to the evolution also of the food industry. As you know, wine quintessentially is an accompaniment for food. And the United States has also undergone a bit of a, a food revolution. Uh, the food in the US, I had a friend years ago who said, you Americans, you have very violent tastes. And, and that was true. Um, a lot of spicy food, a lot of just overly powerful tastes that don't really go well with wine to go well with cocktails, maybe sometimes with beer, but wine needs a more delicate taste. And it's really the slow food movement and a real kind of evolution of the way Americans eat that has also led to this great growth and appreciation for wine, both in producing great wines and in drinking wines with their food. So I thank you. I'm going to stop sharing this, this uh, PowerPoint now. And I think we have some time for some discussion. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for this wonderful sharing. So much uh, to absorb. Now, each time when we drink another wine from California or any American wine, 
apart from the five S's, a lot of things are going to come to our minds, the thoughts, the images um, that Dr. Williams have very generously shared with us. So we now address some of the questions which have come in. Um, a couple of questions from William Chang. Uh, first one is, when and in which country did the first new world wines appear? Other than the missionaries, who else might have been responsible for bringing the first wines out of Europe? Well, uh, honestly, it was primarily the missionaries that did it, because we're talking about uh, Chile, Argentina, um, obviously from Mexico, also into Central, Central, uh, Central America, in Guatemala, um, Honduras. This was really the work of primarily of missionaries. It wasn't until recently that a lot of this more secularization of the wine industry occurred. Um, but during the period that these grapes were first appearing, it was the work of colonizers um, and generally speaking, the Spanish. As you know, all of South America was colonized, um, almost all of it by Spain, with the exception of Brazil, which was colonized by Portugal. And so in all these countries, we have a thriving wine industry today uh, where we had Wine that, that was not brought by missionaries were places like South Africa. South Africa uh, was brought in by people who actually had been making wine in the old world and who moved to South, uh, South Africa and began making their wine there. Um, similar things happened in New Zealand and Australia as well, where it wasn't as much the work of the missionaries as it was of, of wine producers, but this happened a little bit later as well. In the earlier ones, it was more in, in South America, and it was only a little bit later that it, you started having it happen in, uh, in Australia and in parts of Africa. Okay, um, William's second question is fundamentally, what are really the differences between the old and the new world wines? I am a little bit, um, I probably should admit this, but I'm a little bit of a wine snob in, in the <laughs> sense that I really do prefer personally if I have a choice, I tend to prefer old world wines. And the reason for me is very simple. Um, I, I often get the sense that new world wines are trying too hard. Uh, there's been a huge amount of work done in the last 20 or 30 years out of the University of California, Davis, um, about how to test levels of sugar down to the day. So, they will pick the grapes on a very, very specific day. It's very technical, it's very scientifically done, but it's done for the purpose of making wines taste a certain way. So you get a lot of similarity. Uh, there's a lot of this effort to be very, very fruit forward, very, very powerful. And, and they're, they're lovely wines, they're lovely to drink. And in fact, if you take a glass of, for example, a California Cabernet, and a Bordeaux Cabernet. And if you just drink them side by side, very likely the one that you're gonna prefer immediately is gonna be the California. It hits you right away. It's got this very, very fruit forward, very much an upfront punch to it. Um, but as you drink it, it doesn't evolve in the same way that the Bordeaux might. You seem to get everything. It's as if you're in a boxing match and you got hit with everything your opponent had in that first punch. And then little by little, you know, that, that's, that's where it ends. Um, and California wine sometimes strikes me as being a little bit that, that you get so much of it immediately that you don't get some of the more subtle evolution that you sometimes get in the old world wines. That's my experience. It's not that I don't love them. It's not that I don't drink the new world wines very, very happily, I do. It's just that my tendency is to prefer I will tend to prefer the old world. Um, I think that the same has been said about Australian wines as well. You know, uh, some of my friends would say that probably you want to drink them after dinner, not with dinner, because it's just too big and too much in your face kind of thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, next, we have a question from Joan. I hope I can pronounce these words correctly. In California, the Trappist monks at the Neo Clairvaux Abbey and Winery make a very popular dessert wine called Angelica, which is also the exact same altar wine they use. So since sacramental wine cannot be fortified by any unnatural substance, what is the alcohol content of Angelica compared to normal wines? And what accounts for the Angelica's tremendous popularity? Well, 
I just have to correct one thing slightly. Um, altar wine can be fortified slightly. It has to be fortified with uh, fruit of the vine. In other words, you can do it with like brandy, uh, which is obviously a distilled spirit, but it's made from fermented grape wine. Brandy um, is actually short for brandy wine, uh, which is, a, a, you can have some fortification. You can't, altar wine can't be more than 18%. But 18%, as you know, is already fortified beyond, you know, j just mm. fermenting wine, you're going to get up to maybe 15, 15 and a half tops uh, alcohol content. And so to get to 18, it actually has to be fortified, but you, you're not allowed to use any more than that. It still has to be considered a wine and not, and not a, a, a liquor, not a, not a, uh, a distilled spirit. Um, they are very popular. I'm not familiar with that particular wine, so I can't tell you exactly what the percentage is, although I could look it up uh, pretty easily. Um, but there is great popularity in these just because they're very easy to drink. In fact, a lot of people who don't like wine start liking wine through dessert wine because it's sweet, it's something that's very pleasant after a meal. Um, and then they will sometimes pass and, and drink table wines, the, the, the dry wines that are so nice to, to, uh, to drink with a meal. So it, it's often a progression for people who don't necessarily like wine. They will really enjoy the, the sweeter version. And some of them are really, really lovely. This is both old world and new world. You know that the ice wines have been very, very popular in recent years. Uh, and a lot of the, the sweet wines here in Italy, we have them in Pantelleria, which is an island down in the South, makes an absolutely spectacular sweet wine. Um, as you know, too, up in uh, up in the Bordeaux region, you have those those just amazing. Um, why isn't the name coming to me now? It begins with an S. We uh, made from the noble rot there in uh, just just below Bordeaux. Um, boy, the name is not coming. So good with foie gras. Anyway, we'll leave that I'll leave that aside for the moment. But I think that they're just very pleasant. I think that's what explains it. Okay, and next we have a question from Bruce Hemmingson. Um, during the 1600s and so 70s... Turn, yes. So turn, thank you. So turn, yes, of course. Yes, yeah. that's what I was looking for. Okay, during the 1600s and 1700s, was the production of wine the sole preserve of monks and their various missions in California? If so, when did wine production shift to the broader community and what likely events brought this about? All right, this happened, yes, it was the exclusive domain of the monks uh, simply because they were the first one. In fact, it was a huge source of income for them as well as it had been in monasteries in Europe and still, still is made by some monasteries in Europe. But uh, what really changed everything was the huge influx of migrants. Uh, they were American migrants, but coming into California with the gold rush, um, the civil war and there was just a very uh, a period of great, great turbulence in the mid uh, to late 1800s. And then that led to more investment of, of in wine properties and making wine by lay people. And then that with prohibition, basically the monks were getting completely out of the business. Uh, the mission grape dominated uh, until the 1880s, dominated wine production in uh, in California, and it, but it was after that that there was much more importation of European grapes, such as the ones we've been talking about here with the Chardonnays and the Cabernets and the Pinot Noir and and uh, and so many other Zinfandel, so many other wines that are now made in abundance there, and these began to be made by lay people and wine estates, and you had also. Um, wine makers from Europe that were brought in, um, that were hired to come in and produce, you know, great wine. So this was happening for a period before prohibition when they were starting to make nicer, nicer wines. As I said before, that's when everything kind of fell apart. But that's also when the monks definitively got out of the business. So it was in the 18, the 1930s, 1940s, when these big companies like Gallo and uh, Mondavi uh, started buying up properties and started really producing wine in bulk and abundance. Unfortunately, as we said before, these were generally not very good wines. And it was not until the, eight, the 1960s and then into the 70s when these first really great wines were starting to appear. Okay. Um, 
maybe I've missed um, something, but um, when you talked about the prohibition, and then after that, you mentioned the judgment um, of Paris. Uh, there was quite a number of decades in between, right? So yes. can you talk a bit more about how the prohibition kind of, you know, how did it end up, you know, and how did wine started to come back again? Yes. Well, as I said, the, the greatest damage that prohibition caused was not just those 13 years of, of dryness. In other words, 13 years when alcohol could not be legally purchased in the country. The greatest damage it did was the legacy it left on the wine industry, because this association of wine with liquor, the, 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 the perception of wine as booze, uh, led to the production of very bad, very cheap mass produced wines that was sold just as alcohol. In other words, this was just stuff. So this is, we're talking from 18, uh, 1933 all the way up through the 1950s. So this 25 year period was a period of just really bad mass produced wine coming out of California. And there was no effort at that time, no successful effort to make more prestigious, more wines that would, you know, on the international market be something worth taking into consideration. It wasn't until the late 60s and early 70s when you had winemakers that were mavericks that were just trying to make really exceptional wines. And two of those, for example, the Chateau Montalena and its, and its Stag's Leap ended up proving themselves on the international market. So it was really, and it was, it was these individuals who just got tired of this mass produced wine and said, why can't we make some really great wines? And, and it was kind of this pioneering spirit of those who, who really believed it was possible uh, that made it happen. But it was a transition that happened fairly quickly. Um, again, these were not known wines. They weren't, as I mentioned earlier, the California wines weren't even exported to the East Coast of the United States in this period uh, up to the 19, uh, 1960s, uh, just because they weren't known as, as good. They were, they were grocery store wine and they were made you know, just in bulk, but they were not restaurant quality wines. In all the nice restaurants, you were still drinking French wines and, and Italian wines and Spanish wines. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we have a question from Hui Ling Li. Who started the grafting of the vinifera to American rootstock? I can actually give you this fellow's name. It was, believe it or not, a German immigrant to the United States by the name of George Hussman. Uh, he, together with other Missouri grape growers, were the ones who came up with the solution of grafting Vitis vinifera onto the rootstocks. And they were the ones that started this process of exporting uh, American rootstock to France and the rest of Europe. And this began in the 1870s. That's when Hus Husman first came up with this idea. And that's when this, uh, the solution uh, was provided by the US to the problem that had been going on in, in France and elsewhere. Okay, um, another question, this time from um, Sharon. Sharon Tay, what is the issue of the use of wine versus grape juice in Holy Communion? Well, uh, the, the, the thing is this, and you, it's very interesting. Grape juice is, is, a, is a very recent uh, phenomenon. Grape, grape juice did not used to exist for one simple reason, that grape juice by itself will always become wine. Wine, in fact, one of the reasons that um, the church always considered wine to be different from uh, other ardent spirits, if you will, was because it, it, it naturally happens. Wine occurs in nature. Grapes become wine um, without any artificial um, help at all. Um, you, can, you can guide that process, but it does, it's something that happens naturally. Grape juice, on the other hand, did not, was invented by a Methodist, uh, so a Protestant um, dentist by the name of Welch, Dr. Welch. And you might have heard of Welch's grape juice, but Welch produced this, this, this bottled grape juice after Louis Pasteur discovered his process of pasteurization, which was used in milk and used also then to make grape juice. It would stop the fermentation process, but also would, it, it would kill those, um, the, uh, the yeast and the, the, the fermenting um, leaven that would, that would make the fermentation happen. And it would allow the grape juice to stay as grape, but this didn't happen until the mid 1800s. 
uh, when Welch came up with this. In fact, it's very interesting. The, the bottle of wine, the original bottle that Welch produced, the label said, Dr. Welch's uh, non-alcoholic wine, the kind they drank in Nazareth, because there was this belief among certain Methodists at the time that Jesus had made, at Cana, had made non-alcoholic wine <coughs> because they were so, the Methodists at the time were so opposed to alcohol that they believed that Jesus must have made, must have made non-alcoholic wine. But the fact of the matter is that the fruit of the vine in the natural state is wine. And, um, and the church has always insisted that the matter for that sacrament has to be what the matter was at the Last Supper, which was wine, which was fermented. And, and it's very clear, by the way, that it was not grape juice. It was actually wine, first of all, because it was impossible to make grape juice, as I've said. But secondly, because don't remember that it, it, you have to remember that Jesus was called a glutton and a drunkard. And you don't call someone a glutton and a drunkard if you haven't, if you're not aware that he drinks a wine that has the, the capacity of intoxicating. So it was it was a real wine that he made and that he drank. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'm quite intrigued with this Katapa um, wine. Um, is there something that's around today that you would still recommend? Uh, of, of which wine? I missed Thomas. Katavba, the first. Um, uh, Katava, great, Katava yeah. is still made. Um, you know where they use it is in the Finger Lakes region of, of New York. They still make a Katava. There are several places, mostly on the East Coast, where Katava wine is still made. Yes, it's a little more difficult to find, um, but, but it can be done. In, in fact, you know, the U.S. also benefited. The reason that now wine is made in all 50 states and made with the Vitis vinifera grape is also because the solution to the phylloxera problem in Europe became a solution also uh, in the United States. So what they would start doing is doing that same process of grafting Vitis vinifera onto native rootstocks. And that's what allowed them to produce Vitis vinifera wine on the East Coast where that had been impossible uh, before. And also, obviously, with the invention of things like greenhouses and control, because sometimes the, the weather can be so harsh uh, that you have to protect the vines somehow in the winter or they will freeze and die. Okay. Um, the, um, the Paris, uh, Judgment of Paris, uh, Dr. Williams, have there been similar, um, you know, uh, competitions uh, since then? And, and what would happen today, you think, if we had a blind tasting? Um, there was, they repeated this. So again, the Parisians were very upset with, of the outcome of this, of this blind tasting. Um, it kind of offended their, their sense of being, making the greatest wine in the world. And Stephen Spurrier himself, I believe it was six years later, they reenacted um, with a, a, a panel of experts, again, all French, and again, it was a blind tasting. And again, it was U.S. wines that, that took first <laughs> place in both categories. So it was actually uh, kind of confirmed in that way. Again, I, 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 think, I, I think both countries make great wines and they're, they're, the style is different. And people can have, I know a lot of people, I have friends who really prefer, for example, California wine to European wines. They just find it more friendly. They, 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 they like the fruitiness of it. It appeals to their taste. And who's to say that they're wrong? And you know, honestly, we mentioned Robert Parker earlier on today. Robert Parker had a huge impact on the world's understanding of what makes great wine, what tastes good. And he has a very American palate. I don't always agree with him. Um, he, he really likes a fruit forward wine. So you get even in places like Bordeaux, they, they say that they don't listen to Robert Parker, but they do. They do. They will put, when a Bordeaux wine comes out with a 97 rating from Robert Parker, they all put it in their ads because that's very prestigious and it, and it encourages American buyers and encourages international buyers. So it has become, in a way, a, a little bit of an international standard. Um, there's been some ver, ver, uh, diversification now. There are other you know, really good wine critics and, th and their opinions are valued also very highly. But Robert Parker did a lot to change the way the world understands what makes really good wine. Um, and again, 
there are, you know, there are tastes in, in European wines that Americans tend not to like. I, I immediately think of the Rhone area, the Rhone Valley, the northern and southern Rhone regions, especially the northern Rhone. Um, there are a lot of wines produced that, you know, bear descriptors like forest floor or, you know, very earthy or loamy. These are expressions that you almost would never get with an American wine because it's just not assumed to be something that Americans are going to want. But you know, Europeans that have a little bit more the sense of let the wine, let the grape express itself, let let it, let's not control it, let's let it be what it wants to be, you get, you know, a lot more, I think, diversity. And I think that that ends up being very, very interesting to, to certain people. Okay, so we really cannot thank you enough, Dr. Williams, not only for today, but for each and every lecture that you have kind of started each and every lecture with the wonderful uh, wine videos. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure. I think this is such a, a fantastic initiative. And I just love this interplay between art and faith and wine. Uh, so I, I just, I, I'm very honored to have been a part of this fantastic, fantastic initiative. Well, we, we hope we will see more of you in the future, Dr. Williams. Okay, for um, those of us who were, uh, at the lecture last week, we uh, did zoom into the uh, APAVM Art and Wine Benefit Dinner in Hong Kong. Now, Ben sent me the menu to rub it in, and I'm green with envy for not being able to be there in person uh, to enjoy the dinner. And uh, you can see from the photos here, the amazing wines that were served. So it was a very well attended and a very successful and wonderful dinner. And during this dinner, the silent auction, auction was officially launched. Please do register and at least sign in to view the view beautiful pieces on display. We thank Father Joseph Tam, Delma Atelier, and Tan Lim Heng for donating their work. All proceeds will go towards the Bramante Courtyard Restoration Project. There was another dinner on the 8th in Manila, which was also very well attended. And tomorrow, there will be a third dinner in Singapore. It promises to be another wonderful evening with I think already about 60 diners have confirmed to attend. So those of you in Singapore, maybe it's not too late to, to try to get a seat. As we bring this lecture to a close, may I take the opportunity to recognize our heroes who have continued to work tirelessly on the mission of our patrons to preserve and restore the many wonderful works from centuries ago. I urge each and every one of you to support them. Participating in the silent auction would be one way of doing this. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just remind you that this wonderful series of lectures and wine education is brought to you by the Asian Patron of the Arts Vatican Museum under the leadership and benevolence of Ben and Kim Chang. I do hope that those of you who are not yet patrons will consider to join. All patrons will receive wonderful insider's information from the Vatican Museum and the artworks there and have privileged access to the museum without long queues. And of course, to join our annual APA, APAVM trips. There's one coming up in March, April next year. Next week, leading up to Christmas, is our grand finale. On Saturday, 18th December, at the same time as today, we have Maria Cristina rounding off our lecture series with a talk on the wine and wonder of the Eucharist. And Dr. Williams, your work is not quite done. <laughs> um, he and Liz still have another wine video to share with us next week. Thank you everyone for spending time with us today. Have a wonderful weekend and see you all next week.